Welcome to Expresso Engineering. I am Steve Ferguson. Join me as I guide you through the test methods of Mill Standard 461F. Let's begin by discussing CE101, conducted emissions on the power lines. This test method is applicable to ships and a few other areas and uh, you need to refer to the mill standard to make sure that your applicability is in fact uh, called out. Several other tests are, are use this test method. For example, uh, uh, the EPRI, the electrical power research for power plants, and et cetera. The fundamental reason in 461F, for CE 101, is to look at conducted emissions, the current that appears on the power lines. This is used to determine if potential emissions could interfere with other pieces that are connected to the same power distribution. Uh, it's applicable to power leads that come from other sources other than the EUT, such as the power mains or a common power supply system, a bus on an airplane, for example. And it's used for low frequency work, fundamentally for anti-submarine warfare aircraft and for shipboard activities, particularly submarines where low frequency communications come into play. Uh, do you need to do CE 101 to output leads? Well, not by the standard. However, if you're a manufacturer of a power source or an inverter, something of that nature, you may be very conscious that your output could interfere with the, your customer's product. So you might want to use this test method to evaluate what comes out of your product. There are some limits defined in Mill Standard 461 for certain ap applications. However, don't forget that tailoring is always permitted. If an appropriate limit isn't defined, you may need to create one and justify it as part of your planning activity. Several limits are, in fact, provided, and adjustments of these limits are allowed. There's, there is a prescribed adjustment thing for particular applications. So use that in determining the limit that applies to you. Note that if multiple limits apply, you need to consider using the most stringent limit and determining your, your compliance. If this works for all things, then the other applications will be satisfied with it. What kind of test equipment do we need <coughs> to do this work? Well, basically a receiver or a spectrum analyzer with something in peak detection mode and it allows the bandwidth to be selected, those bandwidths that coincide with the mill standard requirements. They're well defined. You'll need a current probe, an RF current probe to pick up the emissions and over the frequency range. Some line impedance stabilization networks, commonly referred to as LISNs. We don't really use them for the measurement, but they decouple the power source and provide a common test standard. They have a little influence over the range, but they do reduce some of the outside influence noises. And obviously some interconnecting cables for the test equipment. Note that when you use cables, there is a correction factor. Although it may be zero for these low frequencies, you need to consider that that's there and always be conscious of your correction and conversion factors. With that, let us look into an important aspect of the test, calibration verification. You need to start the process by determining if your equipment works properly. So you need to determine a current measurement that's below the limit. This allows you to two things, verify that you can detect the signal and that you can detect signals that are below the limit. This verifies that your system sensitivity is in fact adequate to meet the requirements. To do that, let us go through the process of setting up a calibration uh, drawing and with that let me go to the board and discuss how we do this. Okay, let us discuss our calibration verification. Our goal is to check that our receiver system, in our case it happens to be using a spectrum analyzer, is in fact measuring everything properly and that our equipment calibration information for our current probe and cable are in fact working properly. This is our measurement system parameters that we're verifying. To do this, we need to create a signal that we know the value and see if this gets it right. The system is spelled out in the mill standard to use this method. But basically, we're creating a signal 
through a signal generator and an amplifier. And the amplifier is used to get the signal of the right value. So we create a signal at a known frequency, amplify that signal so we can produce a current through the system. Out on this end, we want to measure what's going on here. And we do that with the voltmeter. Most of the time, an oscilloscope is used. And the reason being, we need to be able to cover the frequency range. Low frequency voltmeters may not work. However, an AC voltmeter works just as well as an oscilloscope, whatever is a convenient tool to use. The goal is to measure the voltage that appears here. I'm trying to get the voltage. Now, what determines the voltage? <clears throat> we need to measure at 60 dB below the limit, as we discussed. So our first step is to determine the limit. Let's assume that our limit is 110 dB microvolts. 6 dB below would be 104 dB microamps, I'm sorry, I said volts, should be dB microamps. So our goal is to produce 104 dB microamps flowing through the circuit. To get this into linear terms, I convert to a, 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 an amperage. 104 dB microamps comes out to 158.5 milliamps. I want 158.5 milliamps of current flowing through the loop. If I select a resistor to be 25 ohms, for example, 25 ohms would produce, using Ohm's law, a 4 volt signal here. So if I measure 4 volts across 25 ohms, I'm in fact flowing 158.5 dB microamps through the system. My detection system pieces should measure that correctly. When I actuate the collection software, I am verifying that the current probe factor, the cable losses, if there are any, and any gains and losses associated with my receiver system are in fact accounted for, and that our computer, our PC that's working this system, in fact does all the math to compensate for gains and losses through the system. The resulting measurement that I should see on my display is a limit line with a measurement of the signal we generated. That difference should be our goal of 6 dB. 6 dB below the limit. Now I'm allowed to have some uncertainty account for the system errors and uncertainties. <clears throat> so this totals out to be 3 dB. So if I measure 6 dB difference plus or minus 3 dB, I'm in fact saying my system is working within the tolerances of mill standard 461F. With this, we have now, if that checks out, we do this at two or three frequencies as described in the standard, verify the system works through the range, and at that point we have verified our calibration. Obviously, if there's a problem, it doesn't verify, we will need to do corrective measures to, to compensate for any of the problems and redo the work. So in a wrap up, the PC is adding the correction factors, taking the measurements that we get from our system, verifying that our system is working right. We have, through our measurement tolerances, remember calibration of these pieces is necessary, so we know it's 25 ohms and we know this measurement is correct. So we verify that the current is flowing and then measure it and see that everything is right. Quite frankly, if these are in error, normally this will show that to be the problem. Any any time there's a problem, rework the system, make sure it's all cleared up and working right. Recapping the calibration process, let us assume a limit of 110 dB microamps. And we need to subtract 6 dB to come up with the calibration level. equals 104 dB microamps. At this point we need to convert to linear form and that would be taken care of by 10 raised to the power of this 104 over 20. 
divided by 1e6 to convert the micro out of the equation. So therefore, amps is equal to 158.5 milliamps. That's the current that we will calibrate to make the 104 dB microamps. <laughs> we select a resistor. Select resistor, and we're going to assume a 25 ohm resistor for discussion purposes. And that, therefore, we need to determine the voltage that's going to be measured across the resistor. So the volts, according to Ohm's law, where E is equal to I R, I have 158.5 E minus 3 times 25, resulting in a voltage of 4 volts for the calibration process. These are the numbers that you'll use uh, for that particular amperage. You need to select whatever is your appropriate limit for the calibration. Now let us go on to the pr test preparation. Now that we have got our calibration all checked out, we want to set this same receiver system up with all of the pieces we used receiver system and our cable that we did our checkout with and our current probe. We take those pieces, reconnect them, and except now we're going to connect them to the test article. And so we have our test article, or as we commonly refer to, the equipment under test, EUT. We have that set up to do a power cable item coming across. And we have those lizens that we referred to as part of our calibration and our test configuration are in place. We come through the current probe with one of, one of the lines connected to our power. The other line, the other line comes straight to its respective lizard. This location is five centimeters from the lizard hookup. So our current probe here is at five centimeters. Be cautious when you're connecting here because we're near live terminals. These are exposed quite frequently and we should in fact put some insulation here, but quite commonly we don't. So be aware that there are live terminals and be safe about everything. We connect our current probe and start operating the EUT properly and just run the software to collect all the data. We're doing the emissions across the board. At five centimeters is connection. By the way, both lessons have measurement ports. They should be in fact terminated. That's a common practice to put a 50 ohm terminator because those measurement ports are not used for CE 101, they're for another test. So we're basically running a lesson through the current probe with the wiring. And by the way, what if this is a shielded power cable? The standard 461F says they don't exist. Shielded power cables should be broken out of the shield and power cables run outside of the system. And no matter what, even if a shielded power cable were in play, we're going to want to break the shield at the point of this five centimeters, two, two reasons, to make our connections right and to provide each lead for testing. Once we do the one lead, then we move our probe to the other lead, connect it at five centimeters, and do the same test. So we do our positive and negative, our phase and neutral, and if we have multiple phases, three phase systems, each one of the power leads, including the neutral, will get played as far as <clears throat> getting the test data. With that, we now have re re reviewed our whole process of collecting data. Our results should provide a chart of the measurements compared to limit. Whatever our measurements are, we need to be able to resolve on our, our charts that we present an amplitude plus or minus 1 dB, or resolve a D 1 dB of amplitude accuracy, and 1% frequency. 1% frequency, 1 dB amplitude. So basically, this chart usually does not happen with one take, because these lines are, the slope lines are too much to get all of the 1 dB resolution on a chart. 
you may need to capture data, determine what areas you want to look at, and explode different sections. That's all part of the presentation that's discussed in the standard. With that, I believe we've discussed the whole calibration verification process and now the testing sequence. We now can go to the laboratory and actually run these tests to demonstrate exactly what we've been talking about. Welcome to the lab. As we discussed back in the cafe, we want to do CE 101 calibration verification. This involves a process of a signal generator. Our particular one happens to have an amplifier built in. This is connected to this resistor that we discussed in our drawing. The resistor we've selected is 30 ohms and we verified this thing to be 30 ohms. So with that we can now calculate what our applied current should be and the voltage that we should measure. We take the 30 ohms and bring it into our measurement system and our limit has been determined to be 110 dB microamps, so minus 6 dB would be 104. These happens to be the same numbers we discussed in the cafe. And with the 30 ohm resistor, our current probe factor gets into the equation because we have to consider it. So our current is 158.5 milliamps. And that means that in order to produce 158.5, the oscilloscope or the measurement device, the AC voltmeter, should see 4.8 volts RMS. Let me go over and connect these items. The oscilloscope gets connected across the resistor so we can measure what's being applied. And the current probe gets placed onto the loop so we can measure the current flowing in the system. With these all connected, we're now ready to take some measurements. Our first step is to adjust the signal generator to produce the 4 volts RMS at 1 kilohertz. We produce this item. We're measuring with the oscilloscope because we don't calibrate this signal generator. So I'm observing the level on the oscilloscope and adjusting the amplitude until I get to 4 volts RMS. And I have 4 volts RMS as displayed on our measurement system right here. <coughs> so we should be able to now take a measurement of the current flowing through the system and verify that our system is working correctly. With that, I'm going to use our measurement software and select a value of 900 hertz to 1.3 kilohertz as our measurement point because we're centered around one kilohertz, so we span that area. Uh, we start the software and tell it to run. We select our current probe that we're using, and the current probe we chose was number 615. We use this filing naming convention so we can call up files from our calibration system so we know the correction factors. This, this uh, list selects our equipment in use. For instance, cable number 485, is the one that comes from the current probe to our analyzer. So now the system knows to look up those correction and conversion factors when we start running the software. We select a file name, we're going to call it Cal 101 for simplicity, and execute the software to run. And when we start this system, the, the measurement system drives the analyzer using the right bandwidth for the mill standard and collects the data. We notice that we have a measurement here showing up on the chart that's produced, and our goal was to be 6 dB below the limit. And I have approximately 2.5, 5, just slightly over 5 dB of difference between the limit line at 1 kilohertz and the actual measurement. We're allowed plus or minus 3, as we discussed earlier, so this system says I am working properly at 1 kilohertz. Our next step would be to go after the next frequency. We adjust our signal generator to a new frequency of, not the amplitude, the frequency to go to 3 kilohertz. 3 kilohertz. And these, these frequencies that we're adjusting to are defined in the mill standard to be used for our calibration verification. Our mathematics, our spreadsheet that we use to simplify our numbers, says we want 1.5 volts RMS at 3 kilohertz. We're slightly above that. 
I'm going to adjust where the oscilloscope reads 1.5 volts RMS. And we are there. All I do at this point is I go back to our data collection software, select this frequency range of 2.5 kilohertz to 3.5 kilohertz so we can measure the next sequence. Go, same equipment, the same sensors, etc. in use, so I continue. And we overwrite the file. In fact, when we select overwrite, that means we're appending data. So I have to replace it to append the data. And we execute this frequency and collect the data. And we plot that this measurement is now, in fact, 6 dB below the limit. It's measuring more close to 7, but it's well within our tolerance of plus and minus 3. So we're saying that this system is working very well. Our next frequency point would be to go ahead and collect the data for 10 kilohertz. So let us do that. And quite frankly, I don't like to do 10 kilohertz because it's at the edge of our chart. So I go about 9.8 to 9.9 .9 kilohertz just to, to be not on that, that upper line. So we got 9.9 .9 kilohertz, and we go back to our spreadsheet to determine the value. I should see 475.5 millivolts with this same set of hardware. We adjust our oscilloscope to measure 475.5 millivolts. very sensitive to get to that number. We adjust this. So there is there's about 475 and we should only need to execute our software to go 9 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz for our frequency span. Run the software, the same hardware is in play. We overwrite the file one more time. Yep. And we should collect a piece of data that shows that this measurement should be approximately 6 dB below the limit and it's in fact about 4.5. Again, we're within our 6 dB plus or minus tolerance. So we're very good with our limits. This is in fact a calibration verification. We've seen our system is working correctly and we have data collect collected to demonstrate this. This chart would be used in the report to demonstrate compliance prior to doing the test. At this point, we're ready to proceed to doing the testing for CE 101. Now that we've completed the verification of our calibration for CE 101, we're ready to do the testing. Uh, observe that the test article is now configured, and I'm going to attach the current probe at the right point on the cable and start this testing. As I go over there, I'm going to point out our test article is sitting in kind of behind our test equipment here, with the cables arranged as specified in the standard. And we come over to the uh, network, and remember that now we're exposed live terminals, so we kind of stay away from them and use caution. I've selected the phase lead for testing. I place that in the current probe, observing some basic safety. I stay away from those terminals. And I verify my position is five centimeters from the terminal. We know this by eyeball, virtually. And so now we are connected with the cable and probe that we calibrated. And all we have to do is run the software to collect the data at this point. So let's go back over and execute the software. I've selected the start frequency to be 120 hertz because the software, the standard says we start to test at twice the power line frequency since this is a, and since this is a 60 hertz system, we start at 120 hertz and go to 10 kilohertz. Our software checks everything for the mill standard. We've selected mill standard 461 F. Well, actually, our system says E, but this test is identical. So we basically just run the software. We select the probe that we calibrated, 
and it's probe number 615 from our calibration, you'd remember. And the cable is 485, and that's the same as we checked our calibration. And we have nothing else in the list. And we continue this, and we select a file name. We're going to call it CE101, 101 phase lead, P-H-A-S-E, phase lead. So file name is set up, and then we want to do the execution of the software. The software should execute throughout the system and measure the emissions and compare them to the limit. Now our software settings need to provide for the, exercise, the cycle time of the test article. And now we can see that our test article is, in fact, compliant with the requirements. This is set up in the monitoring mode, so there's no real activity processing-wise. So our limits are set, the 110, et cetera, and these are the emissions profile for that particular test. We would do this test again on the neutral lead to could be complete, and if we have to do all the phase leads, et cetera, so each individual lead. If we get into trying to find problems, sometimes we will use various techniques that we discuss in other areas regarding troubleshooting and using the probe for measuring things outside the normal test. However, this is the uh, final test on that item, and we could repeat on the second item, but for this demonstration, we'll just limit it to the one test. Thanks for joining me on this MIL standard 461F test method review. I hope you find it helpful. I also hope you find the time to join us through the complete journey for MIL standard 461F via the Expresso Engineering Series. Thanks for watching.